Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, why does it say I've seen it? I have not. I probably opened it. Have you ever wondered why? So, I'm ready. Hi, guys. World Graphics. Great channel. Um, I love World Graphics, Biographics, Geographics. Honestly, any Simon, Simon hosted channel is, is fantastic, in my opinion. Let's go. The Art of War, Guerrilla Warfare. There's also Urban Warfare up here. I will watch that as well. Hi, guys. My name's Connor. If you're new, I like to learn about things and watch stuff on YouTube. The original link to the video is at the top of the description, as always. Right below that will be the link to the Discord. Would love to have you. Let's go. Have you ever wondered why some forces can fight and win against much larger opponents? From the Second Punic War to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, today we're going to discover the history and the effectiveness American of this method Red. of asymmetrical warfare. We're going to uncover the strategies and tactics used by the likes of Rome, the Mongol Empire, and the American Revolution, and also explore how Ukraine has adapted to utilize technology and digital age tools to resist occupation. And finally today, oh, we're going to find out why guerrilla warfare is going to remain a key part of future conflicts, no matter how powerful the enemy may be. Let's do it. In war, the battlefields rarely equal. Major military powers expand outward, subsuming their smaller neighbors into a grand design. Armies from the Industrial Age clash with armies that depend on swords and bows. Navies face off with privateers. Cartels point their rifles towards a drone miles above their heads. Regimes declare war on their own people, often whilst robbing them of any ability to fight back. It's difficult to find a war in history that wasn't defined by its imbalance of power, with one force that was bigger or stronger or more modern or better supplied than its enemy. In some conflicts, this imbalance is less a question of inches than it is orders of magnitude, with the underdog outmanned, outgunned, and cornered. Time and time again, guerrilla warfare has been the response to that. A pattern and principle of asymmetrical, often ruthless warfare, guerrilla tactics and strategy have, have allowed minor force after minor force to impose relentless punishment on a larger enemy that they're facing down against. A draw I feel like a big thing about guerrilla warfare is that the there aren't uniform soldiers and so you can't just you can't figure out which are the civilians and which are the guerrilla fighters and i feel like that's a big a big secret to how it's successful endless punishment on a larger enemy that they're facing down against a drawn out painful and almost always defensive approach guerrilla warfare provides means for the weak to overcome the strong bleeding them dry and maybe just maybe, forcing them to give it in. This is the first in a series we're working on called The Art of War. It's going to be diving into the tactics, strategies, and modalities that have defined warfare from ancient times to the present day. Now, if you enjoy this first entry in the series, please let us know in the comments. We've got lots of ideas churning above. We've actually already got one coming out soon because, well, I just liked it a lot. But uh, if you guys do like it as well, let us know in the comments so we make more. The term guerrilla warfare originates from the first guerrilla wars, when humanity faced off against guerrilla no, numbers. <laughs> it's a stupid joke. All right. <laughs> the term actually for a split second, I'm not gonna lie. I was like, what? Originates from the Spanish word for war, guerra, with guerrilla basically translating to little war. The term was first coined during the French Duke of Wellington's expeditions into the Iberian Peninsula, during which he was fiercely resisted by Spanish and Portuguese irregular forces. However, the method of warfighting has a much, much older history. It stands to reason that guerrilla warfare was probably... I thought it was the French who were mainly dealing with... I'm assuming that... I thought the Iberian... During the Napoleonic Wars, the guerrilla warfare on the Iberian Peninsula was mainly directed towards uh, French troops, but m maybe I'm wrong. I say it has a much, much older history. It stands to reason that guerrilla warfare was probably the first kind of warfare that humans practiced, waged with bone clubs and crude arrows in the millennia long before people organized themselves into enough numbers to need a standing army. Since then, guerrilla warfare has seen countless tactical evolutions, while the overall purpose has remained the same. Survive, 
and resist against all odds. From a strategic perspective, guerrilla warfare relies on campaigns of harassment toward enemies, Sabotage. intermittent and unpredictable engagement of their forces, and a heavy emphasis on leveraging any advantages, big or small, that the guerrilla force might have. This could include deep knowledge of the guerrilla force's home landscape, support from a local population, or any specialized weapons, tools of warfare, or civilian resources that can help to even the odds. By engaging in this pattern of warfare for as long as possible while actively avoiding pitched battle conflict and other direct confrontations, a guerrilla force's main objective is simply to buy time. The use and importance of that time and how it's used in a strategic sense depends on an individual conflict. Sometimes guerrilla warfare is used in order to slow down an invading enemy long enough for reinforcements to arrive or even a larger army that can meet the enemy in orthodox battle. In other cases, the larger and more formidable force is just whistled down over time, taken apart by 50 smaller tanks which, when viewed together, incur as many casualties and damages as a single large attack would. Isn't it also to just want your opponent to like think, okay, it's not the losses we're going to take and is not worth capturing the territory? So I guess an objective for guerrilla warfare is to just put up enough resistance so that it, it you just you seem like a target that's just not worth it and obviously that's going to depend on how important you are as a target in still other examples guerrilla warfare is meant to make the enemy forces conditions unbearable such that the enemy force itself their military commanders or their political leaders are just forced to sue for peace as such Guerrilla strategy remains a unique fusion of conventional military tactics with elements of political and socio-economic decision-making, as well as psychological warfare and other dimensions of battle that a larger and better equipped force just really isn't often prepared to contend with. While guerrilla warfare is ultimately a military exercise, combative force is just one of the many tools that's used to turn the tide of a conflict. The element of surprise is just as crucial as the firing of a gun, and creativity is often a more useful quality in a guerrilla commander than conventional tactical knowledge. And speaking of tactics, it's important to remember that the individual decisions of guerrilla fighters are heavily conditional on whatever resources they have at their disposal. But there are some time-tested guerrilla tactics that crop up again and again, and tend to guide the further innovations and choices of a particular group. Hit-and-run tactics are central to guerrilla warfare, a style of surprise attack in which a small mobile force attacks an unprepared or unfortified target that isn't ready to respond. Imagine a supply convoy or an infantry battalion making camp for the night, where guerrillas can attack quickly, overwhelming a small force of guards and do considerable damage before a larger defending force can arrive. By the time the defenders are ready to fight back, the guerrillas are already gone. They've melted away back into the landscape. Tactics like this are routine in a guerrilla fighter's playbook, with night attacks, use of the surrounding landscape, and topology and reliance on the local population for shelter and disguise. And these tactics can be leveraged for a variety of goals, whether to acquire weapons and supplies from their enemy during the early days of a conflict, or to directly target the soldiers of a conventional enemy force. So too are guerrilla fighters defined by their defensive and self-protective tactics, often traveling and living in small, decentralized groups with no base of operations to it. Yeah, when I think of guerrilla warfare, the first thing I think of isn't even guerrilla, guerrilla fighters using guns to, to like, sneak up and, and, you know, hit and run tactics. I mainly think of, you know, sabotaging um, through ways of, you know, maybe uh, destroying bridges or some sort of... Could, could scorched earth be considered a type of gorilla? Uh, maybe not. But just like setting booby traps, I feel like would be a, a huge thing, especially when you have a good uh, idea of your own area you live in and just the, the psychological effect of being an attacking soldier in a guerrilla area, an area where guerrilla fighters are, just knowing you could step in, in some sort of trap at any time, or they could have done something to your drinking water, or the next bridge you cross could explode. All that little things, all those things could, I guess, make a really big mental effect on, on the attacker. Attacks, often traveling and living in small, decentralized groups with no base of operations to attack. The biggest advantage a guerrilla force has 
is that they are usually the ones to dictate when and where a battle takes place. The enemy army may be marching toward a city or a base, trying to make it to their destination and commence an offensive attack, but guerrilla fighters keep that enemy army constantly on the defensive, struggling to reach their target and protect their supply lines with no idea when or where they'll next be attacked. This tactical and strategic landscape turns the attacking army's war of conquest into a truly brutal ordeal, one where guerrilla forces give them every reason to just call it quits and go home. Now, before we go further, it's important to know one thing that's not homogenous within guerrilla warfare, and that's morality. People love an underdog story, and we here at Warographics are certainly no different. Also, those videos do well, but- Sorry, just, just, just uh, I'm pausing too much, sorry. It, Okay, it's crucial to understand that the use of guerrilla tactics don't make either side of a conflict inherently good or inherently bad. As we'll discuss later, guerrilla warfare was just as crucial to the rise of Islamic State as it was to the American Revolution. And how we think about both of those social movements has very little to do with uh, whether they were fought unconventionally. In most cases, it's true. Guerrilla fighters have far more to lose in a given conflict than their enemies, be it their homes, their way of life, or just about anything else. But ideology, political leadership, and heroic or despicable acts are what guides a war. Guerrilla warfare, by contrast, is a set of tools that anybody can use to get the war over with. Just one thing. I feel like the, the effectiveness of guerrilla warfare is by some part determined by by the attitude of the attacking bigger army. For instance, I think that guerrilla warfare would be next to almost completely ineffective against an opponent like the Mongol Empire, for example, who I feel like guerrilla warfare almost uh, necessitate or it, it requires a sort of goal on the enemy in that th their goal isn't just to rape, kill, pillage, right and then continue on to the next place it's to you know they want to manipulate you in some way and so uh, they might have some sort of rules of warfare for instance like uh, a country could set a nuclear bomb off on, on a country if you just want to defeat a country as in it, it well you could drop it, but that won't get to your your end goal so the reason i make the mongols is because i i feel like it doesn't matter if you're a guerrilla a guerrilla fighter or not. They're just gonna kill you when they see you, and so I think that the intentions and or maybe morality somewhat uh, on on a different it could affect how a, a, could determine how effective the guerrilla fighting is. Does that make sense? One of the first known major conflict instances of guerrilla warfare took place during the Second Punic War, which was waged between Rome and Carthage from 218 to 201 BCE. During the war, Roman dictator Quintus Fabius Maximus was in charge of Rome's defense in the wake of a major Carthaginian victory early in the conflict. Aware that he lacked the manpower to beat back Hannibal's forces directly, Fabius instead made the conflict a war of attrition, hoping to exhaust Hannibal's forces long enough for a larger army to rise in Rome's defense. Fabius as Roman soldiers became raiders, harassing Carthage's supply lines and destroying the local sources of food that they knew Hannibal's army would need to survive. Since Fabius didn't actually oppose Hannibal directly, the war strategy was deeply unpopular in Rome, but it allowed Rome's vassal states to resist pressure from Carthage to turn against their hegemon and depleted Hannibal's army severely in the process. This would become known as Fabian strategy and formed the bedrock for later innovations in guerrilla warfare. Other ancient civilizations relied on guerrilla warfare as well, the Scythians, the Huns, the Vikings, and the Mongols, just to name a few. Each of those warrior cultures used asymmetrical tactics to win control over vast territories, and the Mongols in particular used their unique brand of horse archer swarm tactics to create the largest land empire in history. What's more, the Mongols did this despite being outmatched in manpower by most of the major enemies they defeated. Another somewhat later instance of guerrilla strategy's effectiveness was in Scotland in the early 1300s, with its modern reputation coming courtesy of a certain Mel Gibson. In the real events that inspired Gibson's- Look, I know- it's not accurate. I don't, it's just, it's an amazing movie, okay? If you forget about historical accuracy, it's, it, it's such a good movie, guys. 
All right, movie of a certain Mel Gibson. In the real events that inspired Gibson's movie Braveheart, a group of Scottish rebels used guerrilla tactics to resist occupation by English forces. Although the rebels were occasionally able to gather enough manpower from the highlands to oppose the English in pitched battle, more often they defended their homes via surprise attacks, brilliant use of the Scottish landscape, and reliance on small war parties supported by the locals. This war would win back Scotland's independence in 1306. Over four centuries later, the guerrilla the playbook would receive a major update in the form of the American Revolution fought across the eastern seaboard of what is now the continental US. This war, fought between colonial insurgents and the soldiers of the British Empire, pitted the richest and most militarily formidable nation in the world at the time against an under-equipped and ragtag force, mostly made up of farmers and artisans. My great-great-great-great-great-grandpa right there. Against an... I don't know under-equipped and ragtag force, mostly made up of farmers and artisans. Military convention at the time dictated that troops fight en masse in neatly organized lines for what British culture at the time considered to be the gentleman's approach to combat. But the American colonists turned the tables, fighting from cover in the forests and the mountains of New England and the Middle Atlantic region. In the process, they gutted British manpower and morale, and even as British commanders attempted to figure out this new kind of combat, they remained a step behind the rebels. These guerrilla tactics kept the movement alive until the colonies could field a proper military, and even once they did, the conflict never turned into the sort of gentleman's war that the British had hoped for. Instead, it was a valuable early... Look, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not... You're, you will win, obviously. You know, the, yeah, no. N no gentleman's war. No, sir. We will lose. Never turned into the sort of gentleman's war that the British had hoped for. Instead, it was a valuable early experiment on the fusion of guerrilla tactics with a parallel independence movement. Moving into the turn of the 20th century, South Africa saw its own major guerrilla conflict, again with the British Empire on the receiving end. In the Boer Wars, an Afrikaner local resistance was able to compensate for their relatively small force and lack of substantial artillery. Instead of meeting the British outlanders head-on, the Boers engaged in a protracted, constant counter-offensive, relying heavily on individuals and teams of snipers who were able to withdraw before they were caught. The Boers were highly adept at surviving on the South African landscape, eliminating any need for centralization or resupply. This allowed many Boer units to stay mobile, basically indefinitely, and made it easier to besiege British positions Low even with their smaller track. numbers. While the British struggled mightily with supply issues talked over. to besiege British positions, even with their smaller numbers. While the British struggled mightily with supply issues and tried to protect their backs, the Boers leveraged their local networks of control to bring districts and towns back under their control. This soon as British occupiers left. However, Britain also adapted to this challenge with a common countermeasure, scorched earth tactics in which local infrastructure, food production, and civilian populations were deliberately targeted so that the land would become inhospitable. They also used a second countermeasure, concentration camps, which unfortunately require no introduction. The Second World War also saw frequent use of guerrilla tactics on all sides of the conflict, depending on the conditions and the power balance within an individual battlefield or offensive. Perhaps the most distinctive example was that of the French resistance to Nazi occupation, in which dissidents organized into tiny cells, gathered intelligence, smuggled British airmen, sabotaged infrastructure, and distributed anti-Nazi materials. This underground network eventually swelled in size to the point that it aided the Allied forces in taking back France, harassing Nazis who had thought they were outside the reach of Allied ground troops while restoring order in towns and villages. Another particularly fascinating example of guerrilla strategy during this time actually came from the Swiss, who never put their plans into motion but formed the groundwork for a years long asymmetrical resistance to Nazi occupation. I learned about this that plan in another video. The National Redoubt was a result of the Swiss being aware that they couldn't defend their borders or lowland areas for long against Germany. Instead, they built a series of citadels into nearly impenetrable bunkers in the Alps. So the plan went that these citadels would host countless Swiss soldiers with nearly endless supplies, while fighter planes and irregular troops would continue to cause havoc for the Germans while the bulk of Swiss forces retreated. Again, this plan... They never... also had a large amount of personal weapons, like personally owned weapons, right? A big gun culture. That was havoc for the Germans while the bulk of Swiss forces retreated. Again, this plan never had to be carried out, but it was a powerful testament to the value of guerrilla warfare as a carefully considered plan in the face of overwhelming odds. Now... Lest you think we've only got Western examples for you, one of the most masterful uses of guerrilla warfare in the 20th century Vietnam. actually came from communist leader Mao Zedong oh. in China. 
Obviously, uh, we're not going to be endorsing Mao's treatment of his people once he took power, but regardless of anything else, the man was a savant when it came to asymmetrical strategy. Not only did he leverage his troops' ability to fight unconventional battles in order to draw out a war with Japanese and nationalist Chinese forces for decades, but he also enshrined his beliefs on guerrilla strategy and writing. Mao's view on the matter strongly emphasized surprise, misdirection, and being careful to choose the conditions for a favorable, even easy battle or otherwise not engage with the enemy at all. These lessons were passed down directly to Ho Chi Minh of Vietnam, as well as a range of other leaders within various Play insurgencies. Fortunate, son. And, well, speaking of Vietnam, the Cold War saw a range of proxy wars and major minor power conflicts in which smaller or less equipped local forces often received direct instruction in guerrilla tactics by either the United States or the Soviet Union. Aside from the efforts of the North Vietnamese against American troops, perhaps the most effective were the Afghan Mujahideen facing down Soviet invaders. Over a decade-long occupation, the Mujahideen used Western-supplied arms and tactics to wage jihad against the Soviets, making use of Afghanistan's unique abundance of caves along with hilly and difficult terrain. Although the Soviets were able to Hopefully occupy major cities and towns, they were largely powerless to stop the Mujahideen from moving through the countryside, and even though the rebels were never able to coordinate on a large scale, they were able to turn their country yeah, that's the thing. into an absolute meat grinder for the Soviets. That's the thing that, that seems to be a weakness of guerrilla warfare is that coordinated attacks, meaning you need a sort of command structure and a command base of some sorts, I'm assuming, and that would mean a more obvious target than if everyone is just collectively on their own doing what's best, which is impossible, like the optimal strategy for... Ah, I'm talking too much. Soviets. They would were able to turn their country into an absolute meat grinder for the Soviets. They would withdraw in 1989, close to the end of the Cold War. Ukraine doesn't even have to the resort. 21st century. A quick look around the world makes it abundantly clear that guerrilla strategy is still very much a driving force within modern warfare, from the Ukrainian defense uh, against the overwhelming forces of Russia, to the ability of low-tech groups like the Taliban and Al-Qaeda to resist the United States, to the many messy wars of the Middle East and Africa. Asymmetrical and unconventional warfare are just as important as ever. To examine the ways that guerrilla warfare has evolved in recent years, we do need to focus on two examples, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, and the Ukrainian defense against Russia. First, the Islamic State, which took over unprecedented amounts of territory as a largely guerrilla jihadist movement. It's a relatively uncommon but important example of a guerrilla movement that was both a resistance against an international coalition and an occupying force against the ideologically diverse and more often ideologically opposed people living in the territory that it took over. The Islamic State's foothold in Iraq and Syria grew out of the early 2010s, seizing upon the chaos of the Syrian civil war to grow their numbers and establish bases and revenue streams. Using small bands of fighters, usually equipped with small arms and quick, versatile vehicles like pickup trucks, they carved out territory within Syria's most war-torn regions as the regime and moderate resistance groups occupied each other's attention. The Islamic State used this time to consolidate their authority among Syria's jihadist groups, and in the summer of 2014, they swept through major Iraqi cities, energy and resource centers like oil fields and border crossings. Often, the cities and towns the Islamic State took would be held by hundreds or just dozens of fighters who were perfectly aware that the government couldn't respond fast enough to resist them. In rural desert conflicts, their fighters were often able to get the better of armed but slower adversaries, many of whom were unwilling to face Islamic State militants given their truly brutal reputation. However, this example also points to the major problem with using guerrilla warfare as an offensive weapon. Without local support, especially under a draconian and propaganda-heavy regime in which public beheadings, rape, and crucifixion were used as instruments of terror, the Islamic State fighters couldn't melt away into their cities when an international coalition response began. They could flee into the open desert or risk open conflict with local militias or the regime fights that they still didn't have the numbers to win in the long term. After being driven out of nearly all of its territorial holdings, the group has recalibrated its objectives, still launching asymmetrical attempts and capturing some territory, but viewing that territory as one part of an insurgent strategy. Across the Middle East and Africa, Islamic State fighters... I thought he was going to say... Ah, 
still use guerrilla tactics, but they seem to have discarded their goal of establishing a caliphate anytime soon. And by the way, if you'd like to see a longer video on the Islamic State's rise, fall, and resurgence, just, again, let me know in the comments. Now, for our other example, we're going to switch gears in a major way and focus on Ukraine's defense of its territory against Russian aggression. This is another example of guerrilla warfare's value as a primary defensive tool rather than an offensive one, and Ukraine's fierce and creative war strategy fuses asymmetrical warfare with conventional measures. Now, we won't be focusing on the large-scale battles here, but instead on the subversion, the sabotage, the small unit actions, and the technological innovations the Ukrainians have used to level the playing field. Putin's forces have had to fight two distinct but closely intertwined wars in Ukraine. The frontline war to push forward towards Kiev, and the war that is waged constantly in their back lines and possibly even within Russia itself. Take the city of Kherson as an example, which was claimed by Moscow in the early days of the war, but liberated in November. For months prior to liberation, Russian troops in Kherson were under constant siege by sabotage, assassination, disinformation, and skirmishes in the surrounding area. Car bombs, poisoning, drive-by shootings, and more were constant reminders of the Russians' vulnerability, often made worse when the Ukrainian media would publicly identify Russians and collaborators who uh, would be killed later on. Ukrainians behind enemy lines were also able to educate us and civilian population about how best to resist occupation and avoid forced migration to Russia. This pattern has played out again and again in occupied parts of Ukraine, with other notable examples including the bombing of the Kerch Strait Bridge. It's just one of many ways Ukraine has turned the tables on Russia, but the country has leveraged a how massive... How did they do that? How, how that looks like an enormous explosion and it, it was a planted explo explosive right it wasn't a missile or anything so where did they put it I, I feel like there should be like a story around how they did this like how, how did they get get it there? it's just one of many ways ukraine has turned the tables on russia but the country has leveraged a massive network of oh wait was it a did they drive a truck over it sorry Ukraine, with other notable examples, including the bombing of the Kerch Strait Bridge. It's just one of many ways Ukraine has turned the tables on Russia, but the country has leveraged a massive network of military, paramilitary, and civilian operators to resist occupation at every level, often playing upon the incompetence and naivete of Russian conscripts opposing them. The head of Ukraine's military intelligence said as much in March of 2022 to quote, the season of a total Ukrainian guerrilla safari uh, will soon begin. Then there will be one relevant scenario left for the Russians, how to survive. And although the Russians' counterinsurgency tactics have been brutal, alleged to include the horrific torture of many civilians, the Ukrainians in their back lines continue to wreak havoc. Their targets aren't just limited to soldiers and officers either, but logistical support and supply lines too. In classic guerrilla style, these Ukrainian irregulars seem to operate largely autonomously, only communicating with other cells or with Kyiv when it's explicitly necessary. Their goal isn't to amass any large numbers, but to keep their outfits small, versatile, and nearly invisible. And don't assume Ukrainian guerrillas are only active in Ukraine. They've also been able to launch numerous attacks on Russian soil, not only using drone attacks, but human operators as well. The explosions in the Russian city of Berenx, a car bomb that killed the daughter of Russian ultranationalist Alexander Dugin, and unexplained attacks on an airbase just 150 miles from Moscow are among the instances where we can reasonably speculate there are guerrillas involved. And there's a very, very long list of mystery fires within Russia, mostly concentrated in the western regions, that Ukraine has neither confirmed nor denied involvement in. Their targets include power plants, fuel depots, military bases, enlistment officers, centers of heavy industry, and Russia's oil infrastructure, as well as political targets, and, well, we'll leave it to you to decode the subtext in all of this. The other curious the dimension as well, of right? Ukraine's guerrilla tactics is their creative integration of digital age tools into their war efforts. We've discussed Ukraine's innovative use of naval drones in a separate video, but this is just one of many examples of Ukraine's grassroots technological innovation during the war. Time and time again, the Ukrainian military and their civilian population have been able to produce low-cost, low-resource, but very dangerous tools that have helped turn the tide of the war. From turning consumer-grade drones into explosive swarms to potential fusions of AI with existing technology and weapon systems. While these aren't guerrilla warfare in the way Sun Tzu imagines it, they do represent 
a turn in guerrilla tactics. Ukraine and other outmatched defenders like them are heavily incentivized to search for cheap and effective ways to upset the balance of power, opening the door to new tactics that a bigger conventional power like Russia would have no reason to even consider. When we turn our attention toward the future, it's unlikely that we could lay out any hard and fast expectations about how guerrilla warfare will. By the continue. way, when I think of the uh, Ukraine defending itself, I, I think of their ability to. Obviously, there have been guerrilla warfare tactics, like he like it was explained in the video. But I feel like they've been able to beat them just through uh, more regular warfare, you know, on the ground, just beating them one-to-one. Uh, -one. New to evolve. We can expect to see it further integrate new technologies <clears throat> when possible. We can Excuse expect me. it to be used in more theaters of war around the world. But the very nature of guerrilla warfare is to subvert expectations in new and often hyper-specific ways, depending on the conflicts where it sees use. But what we do expect, indeed what we fully guarantee will happen, is that guerrilla warfare will continue to be a critically important part of modern and future conflicts. Even in the long arc of history, guerrilla strategy's most basic parts haven't really changed. You engage the enemy on your own terms, you remain mobile, you rely on the local population, you travel light, and you do it in small units that the enemy just can't prepare for. You figure out what your enemy expects, and you use those expectations against them at every turn. We said it at the beginning of today's video, and we'll say it here at the end. Every conflict is defined by some imbalance of power, be it in terms of manpower, resources, technology, or the will to fight. As long as these imbalances exist, and the more they skew toward one side, the more likely their enemies are to turn toward guerrilla tactics and strategy. They are the tool for the defending side, and a menace to soldiers and generals accustomed to conventional war and easy conquest. Above all, guerrilla warfare is the means for the weak to resist the strong. And as long as the weak choose to fight back, guerrilla strategy and tactics are going to survive right alongside them. Awesome video. So it seems that especially with uh, kind of globalized warfare, that guerrilla warfare maybe clearly was always a thing. But when you think of wars in Europe where you have these relatively equal sides going in these large battles out in the field in this whole big deal and that's where you're defeated and then you give up stuff and you negotiate but when you have different countries that might be more militarily capable going to other places where they just aren't used to that sort of military power and that's the the only option is to resort to guerrilla warfare not to say that I'm sure in all those wars in Europe, there weren't some sorts, some versions of guerrilla warfare. Really cool video. Awesome. I Sorry if I talked too much, but uh, I'd love if you guys could answer any of my questions or just love to see any comments in general. And uh, we'll keep learning, all right? Hope you guys are all doing well. See you guys next time. Bye.